I thought there was work to be done, and indeed there is work to be done. And I thought that I was able to do it. And not really expecting to win, I asked my peers in the Federal Council to make a judgment as to whether I could do it, and I won the election. Well, we need to ensure that the DA becomes a blue machine again, working according to clear goals, clear plans, due process, that we uphold the values that we've always stood for, values like non-racialism, accountability, the rule of law, and fitness for purpose, amongst many others. And to ensure that where we're in opposition, we're a good ethical opposition that calls the government to account. And where we're in government, we run a good government. And that's what we're trying to achieve. Anybody who lives in South Africa and says race doesn't matter is living on another planet. Of course race matters. Race matters hugely. And that's the challenge that we have to work through on a principled and a policy-directed basis. And we've seen a government obsessed with entrenching race policies over the last 25 years. We've seen the outcomes of that. And accepting that race matters, we have to say, how do we ensure that the outcomes are better, especially for the poor and the marginalized? That's what we have to do. Well, there absolutely are enormous policy differences because when you boil everything down in the ANC, their policies are captured in the phrase the National Democratic Revolution. And that means that the party must control the state and the state must control the economy, which means party and state merge and then there is overall control of the economy. We fundamentally believe a different thing. We believe that there's a separation between party and state. A party can get into government but the state serves all the people, not a particular political party, and that the economy needs to be as robust and independent as possible in order to create jobs and grow and create confidence. So that is the fundamental underpinning of the difference, and it spills over into every policy area. Being in government is very difficult, very difficult indeed. It taught me how difficult it is to take an idea, turn it into a plan, and then implement that plan. It's highly complex, not only because of the regulatory environment and the laws, which are very, very difficult to navigate, but it's also complex because it takes a lot of capacity, a lot of management, a lot of data, and time. And when you are trying to get results, it is often very, very frustrating. And there are lots of people working against you all the time, politically, uh, in the communities, um, in your own administration. So it's not for sissies. It's very, very difficult to turn an idea into an implementable policy, attach a budget to it, and produce results. It's not the only place, but it is one place. And interestingly enough, I have used many, many platforms. I do a lot of writing, uh, long op-eds and analytical articles, those sorts of things, which is important. I've written a book which I spelt out a lot of my political philosophy in. And I use social media, and we have to use social media a whole lot more because there are many young people who don't look at anything else but social media. So the challenge is to use a multiplicity of platforms what I didn't know was the extent to which social media could be abused. I took it in good faith. I'm a person who believes that other people will be fair and rational and interpret what you say in context and rationally. And I did not know about Bell Pottinger and the hundreds of thousands of fake accounts and the political agendas behind them and the network of robots or computers that manipulated them. And of course, when you're up against that and naively believing that these are real people in good faith, well, then you're on a hiding to nothing. And I think we've learned a lot about the forces actually controlling social media. 
Well, in every political party, there are, there are intense debates. And I suppose in every political party, there are factions, but factions are changing and moving. And as long as they don't become solidified on the basis of personalities, and as long as people can argue their case and get other people to change their mind, then you will always have groupings that have different ideas in politics. That's normal. What becomes really difficult is when you have factions forming imperviously around criteria such as, let's say, race or gender, and no one is open to a rational debate or argument anymore. That's a big problem, and that's what we have to guard against. And the biggest problem of all is factions that get formed on the basis of political patronage. That has been the curse of Africa, as you know more than anybody else, and that is the big thing we have to guard against in our own ranks. My biggest regret in politics, you know, I'm not the kind of person who has regrets because I learn more from my mistakes than I do from the things I do correctly. And I can't change anything. So I can't change what I did in the past or I can't change what happened in the past. So I really do believe that regret is a useless emotion. You can sit here beating yourself up and having all kinds of regrets. I rather believe in learning lessons and moving on rather than agonizing about the past. I mean, you know, do I regret having given up my retirement? Yes, in many ways I do. I was having a good time. I was enjoying myself. I was seeing my grandchildren. I wasn't in the newspapers anymore, thank goodness. I wasn't the subject of controversy, usually at the hands of totally misinformed people. Yeah, I was enjoying that. So should I come back? Well, who knows? But I can't sit and regret that I did. I can only get on with what's on the table tomorrow. You must never give up becoming a party of government, and indeed we are a party of government. We govern a lot of people, you know. 16 million South Africans are under DA government in one form or another. So we are in government in many, many places. The question is, can we govern well? And can we put people into the positions who really know how to do the job? And that's another story entirely. So that's our big challenge, and we're going to have ebbs and flows, like every political party the world over does as long as we, like every human being, learn our lessons and move on. What scares me the most is this phenomenon known as the failed state. Now, Syria is your classic example of a failed state. But the notion of a failed state is particularly pertinent to us in Africa. Because when states fail, people have to move to save their lives. And the capacity of countries cannot support major migrations in a sea of poverty. And that human suffering, that misery, and the institutional incapacity to deal with it worries me a lot. I think you need to have a central core of ethics. You've got to know the difference between right and wrong. And you've got to be able to stand up for what you believe is right, often against great odds and often prepared to lose a lot. And that means the other great virtue and value in politics is courage. It takes a lot of courage to be unpopular sometimes when you have to and to stand up against an overwhelming zeitgeist that is driving in a particular direction. Thirdly, is this extraordinary quality called leadership. I don't really know what it is because it's so complex and has so many attributes. It has empathy. It has a sense of justice. It has a vision, knowing where you're going, but also this uncanny ability to get people to follow you to the end goal. And it's very hard to describe what attributes make that up. But I think ethics, courage and passion are crucial. <laughs>